Hi everybody, I just wanted to take some time and do a little bit of an introduction to cells and their functions. Um, in this module, we'll be learning a lot and focusing a lot about how the structure of organelles and the structures of cells dictate their functions. So cells have some have a variety of functions, especially depending on what type of cell they are, but there are three general things that all cells do. They move substances, they go through cell division, and they um, are involved in DNA replication and protein synthesis. And so we're going to be talking about movement of substances in a future um, lesson. We have touched on cell division and we'll continue to look at cell division and the structures of the cell that are involved in that process. And for the next few minutes, we're gonna look at um, what comes after DNA replication and protein synthesis. So DNA replication and protein synthesis is something that every, um, every cell does and does a lot of. What they're producing as a protein or lipid products can differ from cell to cell depending on what type of cell they are. But in cells, we have um, what is called DNA, which provides a code. That code from this big giant um, database of code is um, transferred to a smaller piece of material called mRNA. mRNA will take a single code from the nucleus and will lead through the nuclear pore, and it goes to a, an organelle called the ribosome. The ribosome is something that we call a non-membrane bound organelle. It's a kind of a cluster of proteins and ribosomal RNA. And together it makes this machinery that is going to read the code of mRNA, the, that code that came from DNA, that was copied from DNA. And then it's going to assemble with the help of some transfer RNAs, these little amino acids until we get basically the precursor to a protein. So for what we're going to really spend the majority of our time on in this lesson, we're going to assume this process already happened and we have this chain of amino acids that can be called a polypeptide sequence and that is going to be modified um, and eventually becomes different types of proteins. These proteins can be made for production and for use inside the cell. They can also be produced to be shipped out of the cell to go do other things. So um, we will uh, kind of make note of that and you'll do some reading and studying about that as well. So today I wanna to talk about what happens after the production of the protein. And so we're gonna be focusing heavily on the endomembrane system. So the endomembrane system is a bunch of organelles inside the cells that are membrane bound. So these are kind of the criteria to make them part of the endomembrane system. They're membrane bound. Their primary jobs are to modify and transport cellular products, specifically proteins, but there are other cellular products as well that they will modify and transport. And then, um, and then move them and transport them to where they need to go using um, these little pouches that are called vesicles. And um, for a minute, we're gonna talk about how, how the, this is taking place and what is making up the components of this endomembrane system. So as you might um, be able to surmise from the name, endo means within and um, membrane is referring to membrane. And so the majority of cells are made up of strings of these lipids or phospholipids. So this is a long um, macromolecule called a lipid, this particular macromolecule is a, um, a fatty acid. So it's in the lipid grouping. And then on the top here, we get a phosphate group that um, is just a, a, a grouping of phosphorus and some oxygens. And when this little ball is attached to these two fatty acid chains, it gives the phospholipid some, pro some properties. And those properties lead these phospholipids to find each other and be attracted to each other. And so they, oops, um, they line up kind of in a space like this. And then if those phospholipids are in water, they actually arrange themselves so that there's two layers 
with the fatty acid sides point, pointing to each other and the phosphate groups on the outside. So kind of a double layer of a membrane that's going to form the entirety of the cell membrane. It's also going to be the same way that we form lots of other membrane-bound organelles within the, um, the cell that we're going to talk about. So again, here is an example of a phospholipid bilayer. These independent phospholipids have kind of just started arranging them. It has a lot to do with um, charge and being hydrophobic or hydrophilic, water-loving or water-hating. And lipids tend to not really um, participate well with water. They don't dissolve. They're kind of rejected from water. And so the lipid cells end up on the inside of this double bilayer where the phosphate groups are actually attracted to water. And so they are on the outside kind of making a barrier. So water can get in and move through the membrane. But because of these lipid cells that are really trying to hold together and stay away from the water environment on either the inside or outside of the cell, they kind of hold the structure of this cell. And this is an example of um, just a really fundamental um, type of membrane pouch that forms called a liposome. And this is just a bunch of phospholipids that have arranged themselves. And when left alone in water, they will form these pouches with this double membrane on the outside. So anytime that you look at any of the organelles that we will identify as cell um, as membrane bound, that's what's happening. They have a phospholipid bilayer that's making up the external portion of their, of their um, structure and sometimes some of the internal portion of their structure. So membranes in general, um, I've got two tables here, the properties of cell membrane, a cell surface membrane. So if it's the outside of the cell and the properties of membranes for that make up organelles and things inside the cell. So you can kind of take a look at that, but the things that we're going to be talking about today are compartmentalization, folding of membranes and vesicles. We are going to talk about movement a little bit, but not necessarily the controlling part. So um, with that, we will move to this first um, slide here um, about compartmentalization. So we're going to look at this first um, property of membranes and what they can do. So membranes allow for compartmentalization and specialization in eukaryotic cells. So all of these structures, endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi, the mitochondria, um, uh, chloroplast, these are all membrane bound organelles. And so they create compartments where certain things can happen. And that leads to some efficiency that eukaryotic cells have um, and some other benefits that we're going to look at as we go through this. So compartmentalization allows for us to kind of put certain jobs in certain places, make sure the resources are all there kind of collected together, and then it allows us for a little bit better efficiency. Okay, so that's what compartmentalization and specialization means. One of the other important things about membranes is that um, we need a lot of them within the cell because reactions happen in cell membranes. So this is an example of a very important reaction called the, um, the light reaction. And this is how light is converted into ATP energy in the, in the process of photosynthesis. And these protein molecules that are enzymes that help convert um, uh, glucose and, um, wa and specifically water helps us split water to produce energy to make ATP. They need all of these different enzymes to pass through and the membrane is what holds those in place. So, um, we need that membrane to do that and we need a lot of that membrane. So some advantages of compartmentalization, compartmentalization. Um, is that it increases the surface area for energy production. So instead of just having one big open space, we have all of these little compartments that are made of membrane, which increases a, a lot of membrane, and we can do a lot of reactions embedded in those membranes. Um, it gives cells ability to have larger cell sizes because of that compartmentalization. 
Also just the necessity, once you start having lots of little compartments, the cell kind of naturally grows um, while still maintaining some efficiency. Um, isolation or compartmentalization helps us to keep toxic byproducts that are produced by the cell kind of wrapped up and so that they're not bringing or changing the environment inside the cell to be toxic. Um, it gives the ability of enzymes with different local environment requirements to work at the same time. So we could have different organelles that say they have enzymes that work at an acidic pH and others that work at a basic pH. And within those compartments, they can kind of change the environments enough that those processes can take place side by side instead of it being one open cell part and they have to kind of shift the entire environment of that cell before that particular um, reaction could take place. So now lots of things can be happening at the same time because we can control the local environment in these smaller compartments that we call organelles. It also allows for metabol multiple metabolic reactions and processes to, do, to occur at once without reduced loss of intermediate products. So sometimes a metabolic process is a process and there's steps in between and we need the products from one step to, to power or to be the reactants of the next step. And in a cell like a prokaryote that's just wide open, those things are just kind of floating around in the cytoplasm. Whereas in a compartmentalized eukaryotic cell, they stay pretty localized so that those in intermediates are ready for the next reaction in that smaller space. And then um, overall, the cell compartmentalization, compartmentalization has enabled eukaryotes to compete for resources and evolve into really diverse multicellular, single celled and multicellular organisms. Um, this is one of the advantages that they have over bacteria, which are arguably probably the most successful um, living organisms on the planet. Even though they're single celled, they live everywhere. They um, can fight their own battles really well. They um, There's more numbers of bacteria. There's more different types of species of bacteria than there are a number of people on the planet. So really in general, a very competitive group of organisms but eukaryotes are competitive in different ways because they can um, access multicellularity and a little bit more efficient and more metabolic processes to be more complex organisms. Okay, so another thing that it said on the list that's important about membranes is that they can be folded to increase surface area. So one way to increase surface area is if, say I have a balloon and I wanna increase the surface area, I can just make that balloon bigger. But there are some limitations to how big cells can be. And so in order for cells to do more in a smaller space, they increase their surface area by folding membrane. So you can see this is an example of um, a mitochondria and it has two layers of membrane and this inner membrane has been highly folded to increase the amount of surface that we have to do specific reactions that take place embedded in that membrane. So this is one way that we can increase surface area by folding things without really increasing the volume a huge amount. And this is actually one of those underlying principles in biology, well, in lots of science, surface area is a really big deal. Um, and so we wanna look at just some examples that are not necessarily cellular examples, all cellular examples, about how nature has created more surface area while maintaining a relatively um, stable volume. And in the case of cells, rel relatively small volume. Okay, so this is an intestinal surface area and it's got all sorts of types of cells. We've got some elongated cells here. We've got some um, basement membrane cells that look a little bit different shapes. Up here, we have, um, these uh, structures called microvilli and microvilli are the parts on your intestinal lining where all of the food and water and nutrients that you have are passing through and because of all of these projections it slows down that movement of molecules and the um the digested food that you have and it's able to bring more contact of more surface area to more of that moving food sludge so that more nutrients can be absorbed through 
um, these little projections into the cells and eventually into the um, circulatory system so that, that those nutrients can be taken to other cells. So that's one way, projections and kind of what we'd call invagination. So like they've been elongated and kind of um, formed grooves. Um, another example of where surface area has been increased but doesn't change the overall volume area of the plant um, significantly are roots. So roots, we get one big main tap root, and that's um, one way to increase surface areas for this to get longer. But another way is for it to be subdivided into smaller and smaller pieces. And so if you've ever looked at a root, especially one that's just sprouting, it has all of these root hairs. So lots of little fingerling projections off of the cells on the surface of the, the epidermis there that are increasing the amount of surface that can come in contact with water. So we can move more water into those roots faster um, because of that increase in surface area. Uh, um, that in process of invagination and making projections, longer, skinnier projections, are, is also a way of increasing surface area. And we've got a nerve cell here that's job is to transfer information that it's taking in from the environment and then transfer it long distances in some cases. And so a long skinny axon is a good structure if you're traveling a long distance, kind of like a long wire, but to have multiple points of contact um, to pick up lots of um, stimuli in the environment, this, these dendrites or these branches can keep subdividing and, and grow more and more of those to increase the amount of surface area. And then the production down here where neurotransmitters are produced, again, the same thing you see as splitting or a, um, dividing instead of just being one sheet of material, every cut or slit down in there gives us more three-dimensional surface areas to be able to um, for um, biological processes to take place. Your lungs are another place where surface area has been, the idea of surface area has been um, kind of a guiding principle. Our bronchioles, um, our lungs break down into smaller and smaller and smaller components. So you have bronchi that bring the air in and then those split into um, bronchioles and then those bronchioles eventually differentiate into these single cell, a single cell wall thick um, pouches. And those pouches are really thin, but instead of just having one big bag of tissues down here, we have these like thousands of little tiny balloons. And because we have little, lots of little balloons, all of that is surface area that can be um, interacting with gases that are moving both in and out of the, of the cells. So the general idea with anything where surface area has been maximized is because we need to do a lot of something and we don't have a lot of space to just grow bigger. So we subdivide. I got some examples here, maybe just take a look at these really quickly and, and kind of hypothesize how is it that this structure is um, meeting the requirements of increasing surface area. This elephant might be obvious. He's got really big ears. So a really big over-exaggerated organ that's thin and we have the two sides um, can increase the surface area. We also have a brain that can only become so big because it's um, growth is limited by the skull that it sits in. And so one way that the brain grows as much matter as it needs to be able to function at the high level that the human brain functions is it folds this the gray matter. So it's a really big sheet, but to get it in the brain, it subfolds. And so all of those folds provide us more and more surface area for um, neurotransmitters and messages to travel through the brain and reactions to take place that need to happen. These are both, oops, these are both corals. So you can see different ways that these corals have subdivided to create more surface area because they live aquatically. Their food is often flat, floating past them. And so it gives us more surface contact with these branching kind of um, structures rather than just a smooth surface. 
And same here. This is a mitochondria, a artist rendering of a mitochondria. And you can see, like we mentioned already before, that the mitochondria has this inner pouch, an inner membrane, but it's so big that in order for it to be put inside the outer membrane, it has to be folded. But the foldings there, rather than keeping this inner membrane small, give us more and more space to do some of those important chemical reactions like respiration that require membrane proteins to be able to do those. Okay, so keeping that in mind, the idea of surface area is kind of a driving force for different structures and functions in nature. We can go back and look at cells now. Prokaryotic cells are things like bacteria. They don't have a nucleus and they don't have any membrane bound organelles. They don't have compartmentalization like we talked about earlier. But that means in order to do lots of different functions, they have to have foldings of cell membranes that can just generally provide space for those reactions to take place. And then they can't do all things at all times um, because they don't have the compartmentalization or the, the size or the surface area to be able to run multiple reactions at the same time. That keeps um, prokaryotic or bacteria organisms fairly simple, single celled, um, but they do important processes like respiration. And in the case of um, photosynthetic prokaryotes, they can do photosynthesis. They just use it, they do it by embedding those processes in membrane um, membranes that they have that are just infoldings of their cell membrane. Okay, so in contrast, this is a eukaryotic microscope picture of a cell and you can see a nucleus with a nuclear membrane around there, or sorry, this is a nucleolus. So there is, there's no membrane around this. You can see the kind of jagged, um, uh, kind of not smooth surface because it's just a combination of um, RNA and proteins that have just been kind of bundled together. But then you can see all of these layers of membrane. This is the cell membrane where those red arrows are. This is the these little back and forth membranes that you can really get a look at that double membrane process. These are endoplasmic reticulum. We've got some Golgi over here. We've got these little pouches that are called vesicles. And this is a mitochondria. Um, with different folds in the membrane here. So those are just a couple examples of how even within the compartmentalization of the organelles, the organelles are also subdivided and have ways of increasing surface area so that we can just be running multiple chemical reactions in the most timely efficient way and in an organized way within the cell because things are kept compartmentalized. Okay, so as a part of this endomembrane system that we're going to be talking about, one of the important parts of how it works is through something called vesicle production for transport. So the endomembrane system is a combination of any of our um, organelles that have membranes and that are continuous with each other in some way. So either they touch each other or they're gonna communicate with each other by pinching off little pouches with products inside, say proteins. So the protein that has been modified here in the endoplasmic reticulum now has been bundled in this little pouch. And now that pouch is going to travel here to the Golgi, it's gonna fuse, and the protein will move into these pouches and kind of move through the space of the Golgi. In the process, it gets modified and it, get ta it gets tagged for transport. And then it gets secreted from the Golgi as a um, vesicle. Then that vesicle may fuse with the cell membrane to be transported out like this vesicle is here for exocytosis. This um, fused uh, membrane pouch is going to fuse with the membrane of the cell and then kind of open up and dump those um, proteins, whatever, or enzymes, or whatever it's got inside there. Um, sometimes these vesicles will fuse with other organelles within the cell, like a lysosome. Lysosomes have enzymes that break things down, 
And so if we've just got extra or waste materials, the lysosomes can fuse with those vesicles and um, be able to help break down that extra information, the extra product. Okay, so those are some of the components of the um, endomembrane system. An important component, as I mentioned, are vesicles. They sound really simple, or and they might not be something you've heard of before. And we're not going to get... Uh... Okay, so vesicles, I'm going to show you two videos. This first one is kind of moving. You can see this is a vesicle cross-section inside our the proteins or enzymes or whatever is packaged it fused with this either the membrane of another organelle or the cell membrane and when it did that it was able to open up and basically neatly drop its supplies into the inside of this structure so watch that again it opens up, the membrane kind of fuses with the membrane structure of the organelle that it communicated with, and then the materials, chemical messengers, proteins, whatever they were, were delivered to the next spot. Okay, I have another quick video, just another rendering of this. So here is a vesicle, a cross section of a vesicle, and there are substances inside of here. These could be waste products that the cell has made and contained in a lysosome. It opens up and can um, let out whatever was inside it in outside of the cell into another organelle. Wherever there's, wherever there is membrane, this process can take place. A pouch of membrane can fuse with another membrane and transport materials across those membranes. Okay, so going back to this endomembrane system where those vesicles are a really important part, the endomembrane system is going to involve the nuclear envelope so this is the membrane that is makes up the nucleus. So if um, uh, we get messages from the nucleus, they are going to leave. We have um, ribosomes will create those beginning of proteins, and then those beginning proteins will go to the endoplasmic reticulum, and this is where it starts in the endomembrane system. So within the endoplasmic reticulum, Proteins will be modified. Sometimes um, in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, we have the building of lipid molecules that are needed for other things. Then those proteins or lipids are packaged in vesicles that are pinching off from the endoplasmic reticulum. Those travel directly to the Golgi. They fuse with the Golgi on the cis space, and then they transport through here as they are moving through there. They're being modified and changed and then packaged in vesicles on the back end. And then they could fuse with the cell membrane or lysosomes. So endomembrane system, nuclear membrane, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, lysosomes, vesicles, cell membrane. Those are kind of all the parts that are gonna be important in that endomembrane system and that work together to get those proteins mostly packaged processed and identified for where they're gonna be going. If the um, proteins were made on ribosomes that are free floating in the cell, they are most likely going to be used within the cell. If the ribosomes are attached to what we call the rough endoplasmic reticulum, you see little bumps of ribosomes attached on the rough, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum will not have any. Those in uh, ribosomes that are attached to endoplasmic reticulum are making proteins that are going to be transported out of the system because they're going to go through this whole process of being 
modified and marketed and um, marked for delivery and then transported through vesicles out through um, a process called exocytosis by fusing with the cell membrane. 